Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Dr. Phyllis Harrison Ross is a multitasker par excellence. She's a psychiatrist, a pediatrician, and someone who has worked to bring healing to the victims of natural and man-made disasters here and abroad. In her position as commissioner and chair of the Medical Review Board of the New York State Commission of Correction, she has yet another role to investigate all deaths in the state's detention and correctional facilities, to track the health care needs and treatment outcomes of inmates, and to recommend improvements to the prison health system. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I suspect that a lot of people are not familiar with the commission. Can you tell us when it was started and what your mandate is? Uh, it was started in 1876, I believe is, was the year. So it's a constitutionally established uh, commission. And we are separate and apart all the, from uh, the other parts of the government. Uh, we are nominated by the governor uh, and uh, we are approved uh, by the Senate. Okay. And the function of the commission is to, as you describe, to regulate and monitor all jails, prisons, and lockups in the state and the secure juvenile facilities as well. Uh, we uh, set the regulations. We regularly check them to see that the, uh, the jails and the, the county uh, lockups and the prisons are, in fact, following what they're supposed to do. Uh, and then we also uh, investigate all deaths. Since I've been on the commission, I think I have looked at maybe 8,500 deaths. I don't investigate all of, all of them in depth, but uh, I do, uh, do see all of them. So how many, how many uh, institutions are we talking about, state and, we're talking about state prisons and, and, and city lockups, how many altogether? I'm, I'm not sure of the total number, but it's a large number. That there's 63 counties, uh, and then I think that similar number of state prisons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the, you have the counties, and then in the cities you have different you know, jails right. and uh, lockups mm -hmm. and detention centers and court pens and so it's throughout the whole state. Do you know how many what the, what the number of the prisoners altogether? My uh, I I think in the city now there uh, may be about uh, I'm I'm guessing because I don't know the the exact number but I think I, it's about eighteen thousand and then. In the state, I think it's m about 83,000. Okay. Uh, yeah. Has that number been going down? It's been going down. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you actually, there have been actually been some prisons that have been closed in recent years, yes. correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and there are three commissioners. There are three commissioners, okay. yes. The, um, each of us has a separate function. Uh, there is uh, the chairman commission. He has the administrative uh, function of, of staff and, and meeting with with the, the various uh, portfolio carriers for the commission. Uh, then uh, there is the Civilian uh, Complaint uh, and Review Council. Uh, the commission, there's a commissioner that chairs that, and that's where all the complaints come in. And then there is the Medical Review Board, uh, which in, uh, investigates all deaths and um, sets policy, provides technical assistance to of the jails and lockups, and that's the uh, board that I chair. And do each of you have your own? You have staffs of your own? Um, that's a lot. Well, of we have staff that are designated to work with us. Okay. I have a, a, a forensic service of investigators that actually go out and do on-site investigations of uh, of things that happen, right. and mostly uh, investigations of of deaths. We have offices, I have offices in Albany, and I have an office in Harlem, in the state office building, and also, and so there's staff there, there's staff in Harlem, and then there's staff in Albany, and then uh, for doing televisiting and uh, teleconferencing, uh, I use the uh, 
actually I use the governor's uh, teleconferencing okay. equipment in his office. Okay. And one of the, I, uh, I was reading that one of the jobs of the commission is not just to investigate deaths, but also to investigate prison escapes. Uh, yes, yes. I hope there haven't been too many of those. Not, no. I hope there haven't been 8,500. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, 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 no. I, as a matter of fact, I'm trying to recall the last one was, I think, uh, it, it, sort of at the end of last year. Okay. Up, it was upstate. I don't remember what okay. county it was. And how long have you been on the commission? Well, I've been a member of the uh, Medical Review Board. I started in uh, 1976. That was at that time a volunteer position. The Medical Review Board is made up of seven people. Um, five, uh, six doctors and a lawyer. And uh, I was one of the doctors at that time and I did it as part of my function as director of the Community Mental Health Center at Metropolitan Hospital, which is here in the city. Uh, and then in 2009, I, w uh, I had by that time retired as director at Metropolitan Hospital and the staff suggested, why don't you consider becoming one of the commissioners? There was a spot that had opened up. So I did, and I was appointed uh, a commissioner by Governor Papson. Okay, and now you're chair of the, uh, of the Medical Review and Board. And I chair the Medical Review Board, yes. The governor designates which of the commissioners chairs what committee. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now there have been there have been in, there have been several high prof profile stories in the news media recently about um, raising issues about you know medical conditions and care of inmates. Um, uh, for instance, in February, a, a mentally ill veteran, this is Jerome Murdoch, died after being left unattended in an overheated cell in Rikers Island. All of these were locally. Uh, two years ago, Jason. Echeverria, a Rikers Island inmate who had swallowed a toxic soap tablet, died after repeated after making repeated calls to help for a cor uh, corrections officer who ignored him. And last year, Kim Livingston, a 37-year-old woman who was complaining of stomach cramps and diarrhea while in a cell at Brooklyn Central Booking, uh, died after her pleas for help were ignored by the police there. Sort of suggest. I mean, if you look at just looked at those cases, I mean, um, one would say I sure wouldn't want. Well, I wouldn't want to be in a New York City jail or prison yeah, but, to begin with, but I sure wouldn't want to be one in one if I got sick. Well, uh, those are are uh, unfortunate and tragic uh, situations, and and because I have the responsibility to investigate them and I do know all of those, um, all of, about all of those incarcerated people who died, uh, I can't really comment specifically on, on the cases. However, um, I can talk about the fact that uh, there are increasing numbers of people being incarcerated who are sick physically and um, mentally. I think uh, one of the public reports that has come out from the Board of Corrections actually um, it indicates that 47% of the people who are admitted to Rikers uh, are, um, have a mental health diagnosis and a serious one uh, as well as substance abuse. Right. Uh, and uh, that is the reality that we are dealing with in those systems and those systems were not built to take care of sick people initially they were they were built to decay and punish and hopefully rehabilitate mm -hmm. <laughs> people but right. not to take care of sick people right so uh, the, the 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 staff and uh, w certainly with our encouragement, uh, running as fast as they can, trying to catch up with, uh, with what they have to, how they have to structure themselves in order to be able to take care right. of Right. I know that the head people. of the uh, Correction Officers Association, union, whatever, has said that he, he really feels that, that, that his members need better training, I guess, mm -hmm. in 
uh, recognizing and dealing with, you know, mentally ill and I guess sick inmates. And I think that some uh, proposals have come out uh, for to do that and that the Board of Corrections here in the city, uh, which is, is not my board, we're, we oversee what that board does, um, is recommending that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly, uh, we're all talking about what are, what's needed now because how would we you, have to deal with those numbers. How would you rate uh, the prison system, the state prison system's um, response to sick inmates in general? I think you'll be surprised to hear me say this, but they've come a long way, actually, uh, since I've, I've been watching this since uh, 1976. And they have uh, completely turned around their structure. They have regionalized. They are set up uh, like a a public health system would set up a series of hospitals, you know, primary care, secondary care, tertiary care. Uh, they have uh, hospice. They have the whole kind of system of care. And they're actually, I think, doing a good job. First off, you have a confined population, so it's a lot easier to get people to be compliant with medical care. Right. That this is not the, not the case in the jails right because in the jails people come and go very quickly so then you you can't really manage their care uh, but they had the uh, health department state health department established um, I think now this is the sec this is going on the third year uh, with the uh, division of criminal justice services we uh, they established a task force to look in, in the context of Obamacare, to look at how uh, we can better integrate how services are delivered uh, on, uh, in the jails and prisons, right. but in the jails particularly because that's where, where you have this fast turnover and you have right. people coming in, you start treating them for their diabetes and they're gone, and they can be gone overnight. Mm -hmm. Uh, how can we begin to hook up together in a way and use uh, a really excellent uh, electronic health record that they have uh, developed at Rikers uh, to follow people, to have care managers, which are part of Obamacare, so that when they, if they come in jail, the, the treating people in the community and the treating people in the jail are in communication, uh, you don't have someone coming in and getting the same work up every time, but not moving right. forward. Right. Um, and they uh, are doing um, assessments that are more comprehensive. Okay. So you're getting not just a physical assessment, but you're getting a, a mental health assessment, substance abuse mm -hmm. assessment, educational assessment. Uh, of course, violence potential assessment right. uh, and uh, recidivism, uh, but it's a it's a more of a comprehensive approach, and I'm really hoping that uh, uh, it, that's done in the in the state prisons and also at Rikers right. as well. And I'm really hoping that uh, our uh, newly elected mayor and uh, uh, will uh, you know will also have that kind of interest mm -hmm. to really continue with doing those kind of thorough uh comprehensive workups and uh and and hooking up with community based programs so okay. that the prisoners can that are sick can get into health care as soon as they leave okay we're going to take a short break then we'll be back with more with Dr. Phyllis Harrison Ross after this message Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Dr. Phyllis Harrison Ross, Chair of the Medical Review Board of the New York State Commission of Correction. We were talking earlier about the high number of inmates, detainees in the New York State system who have 
mental health problems and probably beyond that, you know, drugs, substance abuse problems. You know, I've always thought that probably most people who are in prison could benefit by having a weekly session with a therapist, you know, a psychotherapist, you know, like, like everybody on the West Side does. Mm -hmm. um, but is, is that available to any inmates at all? Or I, I guess I'm asking you what kinds of mental health services are available to, to prison inmates? Uh, in, in the prisons, there are um, quite elaborate uh, services. The services are uh, established by the New York State Office of Mental Health. And uh, they essentially run a comprehensive primary prevention uh, through uh, tertiary care mental health system. Uh, they do assessments. Uh, they do uh, evaluations uh, uh, when people are acutely ill. And they do ongoing treatment and regular treatment, they do medication, uh, and they have different types of programs because the prisoners have to be housed uh, according to their special needs. Right. And if they have mental health needs, then they, they have to be in special mental health I know uh, there's situations. Medica I know that there's medication, and the mm -hmm. few visits that I've had to prisons, I know that there are this group therapy. But if mm -hmm. I am an inmate in a prison and say I am deeply depressed, uh, profoundly depressed, and I'm diagnosed as profoundly depressed, would there be a possibility for me to have a weekly uh, session with a therapist the way I would outside if I needed that? Uh, in theory, you could. Uh, in practice, it it's, of course, a matter of staffing. Mm -hmm. And also, um, uh, the uh, clinicians are determining how often you should be seen. And they do see people uh, on a regular basis, and depending on how sick they are, mm -hmm. um, uh, they could see them every day. How many um, psychotherapists would a, a prison have? I mean, would they have, I mean, I've heard, heard stories, you know, and I don't, they're probably outdated, you know, the one therapist, two therapists for 1,200 people. I don't know what the staffing, what would the staffing levels be? Again, the staffing levels vary depending on the kind of, of uh, prison that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So if it's mm -hmm. a maximum security prison, you may, in fact, have a lot more mm -hmm. uh, clinical people than in uh, the minimum security. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it is uh, like Marcy a Correctional Facility, which is for exclusively for mentally ill uh, prisoners at this point in time, and, so, and it is uh, an excellent state-of-the-art, cutting-edge program, uh, they have, um, they have a significant number of uh, clinicians. It isn't as bad as it sounds, <laughs> you know, and I've heard, the, I've heard these um, kind of, of statements. It certainly has gotten better over the, over the 35, 40 years that I've been uh, working there, uh, but but I would like to see more uh, mental health clinicians, clinicians in general, but especially mental health clinicians, psychiatrists, social workers, psychologists, nursing, to really uh, study correctional health and mental health uh, in their graduate schools so that they learn uh, what they need to know to be able to work with, uh, with an incarcerated uh, clientele. You have mentioned one facility that's just for mentally ill mm -hmm. uh, inmates. Um, uh, do you think that there are a large number of inmates who ought to be in special facilities for the mentally ill and not in prison? Yes, I do. I, I do think that, um, uh, that a lot of the people who are mentally ill, uh, certainly had they been picked up earlier in the community, wouldn't be in the in the jails and in the prisons, mm -hmm. and that uh, we, we need to uh, examine our own souls and hearts, if you will, to look at why it is that uh, this uh, kind of population or this kind of, of, uh, of a person 
uh, is not picked up in community-based services and then ends up doing something that gets them incarcerated. And do, you, do you think that a lot of them who say are have been convicted of a crime but have mental health problems should probably be um, sent to a mental health hospital and not to a prison? As a uh, I, I, won't, I, I can't use the word a lot because I don't have numbers that would, would justify saying that, but uh, for example, in Brooklyn, they have mental health courts now where uh, people are actually uh, seen, they, they're brought in, they're arrested, the whole works, but they're seen in a mental health court and they can be uh, uh, given an alternative to incarceration, which would be mental health treatment. And that seems to be the wave of how things are going to go. Right, right. Um, there's been a lot of criticism recently, uh, public criticism of the practice of solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. That it often, that it can drive inmates mad, that it's cruel. It would drive you and me mad. Probably. Mm -hmm. um, yet I would, is it, is solitary confinement something that's routinely practiced in New York City prisons? And do you, would you like to see less of it or? How do you feel about that? Um, yes, I think everyone would would like to see less of it. Um, the special housing units are are there because it's necessary for uh, control of the situation of incarceration, uh, and uh, that's now what we're doing. However, uh, in in prisons throughout the country, is looking at ways to do this in a more humane way. And in New York City at Rikers, they have the CAPS unit. It's a new unit that was started last year. It's clinical alternatives to punitive segregation, uh, and where they have clinicians and they have specially uh, trained and supervised uh, correction officers, and they are kept in a unit which looks more like a psychiatric uh, facility than these uh, small units, uh, the box, you know, what they call or the special housing units. Or, and uh, it seems to be working, and I certainly hope that it continues to. And there is less work. isolation in those units. The, yeah, there's no, there's no isolation. No isolation. The, the actually, they come out and they mingle, and they have ongoing um, groups and ongoing sessions with their clinicians okay. who are there with them. I see. What do you think can be done? And it's a big, it's a big question, but you've been uh, uh, working with the commission for a long time. What are some of the things you feel can be done to make prisons places that actually rehabilitate people uh, and, re and, and, and that might actually reduce the rate of recidivism? What kinds of reforms would you like to see? Well, my focus is really on the health care, and I, being a, a physician, believe that health, if you have good health, it helps you <laughs> to do a lot of things that you want to do in life, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that the, the, this assessment of really getting people completely worked up, is, and I, I want to repeat it again, to have a physical exam, to have them have a, additionally a psychiatric, a psychological, an educational assessment, a job capability assessment. Um, I think those uh, kinds of assessments and then acting on what the findings are right. uh, with individual, we'll call it treatment slash correctional plans, right. I think. Uh, is what needs to be done, but also I think that the community has got to be willing to accept them when they come out, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that there have to be programs. And I have uh, been very strong uh, in in saying uh, that I think the faith-based community should step up with the kind of social capital and social support systems uh, that would be and be willing to accept. Uh, these people, when they come out uh, into their uh, religious communities, faith-based, um, you know, whatever religion, right, right. Uh, or like with me, ethical culture, right, and to really uh, accept them and their families. Uh, 
I don't think we do that now in the city. I think we just let the people come out and then they have to find some place to live. Yeah. And, and uh, we don't really want them. Right. And I really think that there's, there's a job that the society and the community has to do and then there's a job that the prisons have to do. Of course, you do have, I mean, you have uh, organizations like Covenant House, which, which help student, uh, former inmates with transition and provide some kinds of housing. And I know you have, you know, churches like Riverside Church that have support groups, you know, for people who have mm -hmm. been in prison. I, and I would imagine you're talking about more programs like that. The programs like that, but I, I'm saying take it one step further, accept them into your regular programs as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that they feel that they are part of the community, not in, not a part of a specialized, formerly incarcerated person group, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but actually bring them all the way. Okay. Well, it's a big issue, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one that uh, your commission and all of us will be dealing with in the years to come. We're out of time, but I want to thank Dr. Phyllis Harrison Ross for joining us today. For more information about her work go to nysec.org for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.